Hi, my name is Kim White and I'm the Natural Naturalist. And today we're going to talk about how we put animals into groups and why that helps us. You know, people like putting things in groups. We do it all the time. Think about in your kitchen. If you wanted a spoon, where would you look? Probably a silverware drawer. And in that drawer, you would be able to decide, do you want the little spoon or the big spoon? What about what for breakfast? Well, you can go into a cupboard, I'm sure, and you probably have a whole bunch of different cereal that you can choose from, so you can decide which one you want for breakfast. Well, we do that with animals too. But we're gonna see how we do that. So I want you guys to think of a big giant box. And in that box, it says all of the living things in the world. When we open up that box, we find two boxes in there. One of them says all of the plants in the world. And the other one says all of the animals in the world. Well, we like animals. We're going to take that box out and we're going to look to see what's inside of that. We open it up and in there, there's two boxes. One of them is labeled all of the animals that have backbones. And those are called vertebrates. The other box says all of the animals in the world that don't have backbones. And those are called invertebrates. Well, we're going to take a look and see what's in that box said vertebrates. When we open it up, there's five boxes in there. Birds, mammals, reptiles, amphibians, and fish are labeled on those boxes. So, when we see an animal, we're going to try to figure out what box we would put that in. Now, the first thing that we do is we use our eyes. And when we use our eyes, we're looking to see what is covering that animal's body or what their skin looks and feels like. The first one we're going to do is birds. Now, when we look at a bird, what do they have all over their bodies? Now, I know some of you might be saying wings, but I want you to know what's even on the wing. What covers their whole body? That's feathers. And I have a feather right here. This is a feather that is from my blue and gold macaw. And it's one of the wing feathers. It's a very strong feather that's going to help this bird to fly. But not all feathers and not all birds fly. I bet you can think of a bird that doesn't fly. It's really, really super big. An ostrich. Yeah, ostriches, they don't fly but they still have feathers. Can you think of another one? It swims. A penguin. Yeah, even though a penguin doesn't fly in the air, they do this really cool thing. When birds fly, they make the number eight that's sideways, and that helps them to fly. And when we watch penguins, guess what? They move their wings in the same way. So they kind of are flying through the water. Now, some feathers, like this peacock feather, they don't help a bird to fly, but they're very pretty and they attract attention, and it might be for someone special. So they have feathers. Now, how do their babies come into the world? Are they born live or are they hatched? So birds hatch out of eggs. Now, those eggs can be very different. They can be as tiny, can you see that? As a hummingbird egg. They can be the size of a chicken egg like we're used to, or they can be as big as an ostrich egg. But the babies will hatch out of eggs and that's another thing that makes birds special. So they hatch out of eggs. Now, do the parents take care of their babies? They do, but sometimes in very different ways. Think about a bird like a robin and I'm sure you've seen a picture of a robin in a nest. When they first hatch out, they don't have any feathers and their eyes are closed. So are they going to need a little bit of work or a lot of work? Well, 
those parents are going to be going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth all day long, sometimes over 12 hours a day, looking for food, coming back to feed their babies and going out to find food and feed their babies. Do it all day long, so that's a lot of work. But not all birds are like that. Think about a duck. Now, a duck hatches out of an egg, but its eyes are open and it has little feathers all over the body. It can walk and it can even swim. So those babies, think about that. Are they gonna stay in one place and have the parents come back and forth? Or are the parents gonna say, come on, follow me and I'll show you what's to eat? That's right, you've seen them. Those ducklings follow the parents and the parents are then able to show the babies what is to eat. This is my friend Roscoe. And Roscoe is an African gray parrot. And we can see that it's a bird because he has feathers. So, because he has feathers, we know it's a bird. Was Roscoe born live or hatched out of an egg? Roscoe was hatched out of an egg. And the parents took care of him when he was little. Roscoe can talk and make some really cool sounds, but he only does them when he wants to but Roscoe is a very cool bird. The next group we're gonna talk about is mammals. Now, this should be a fairly easy one because you are one of them. Now, think about mammals. What do you think they have all over their body? When you look at each other, what do you see? What's on the top of your head? Hair. So mammals have hair or fur on their body. This is fur from a beaver. And the beaver fur is going to help an animal and the fur is gonna help all the mammals because it's going to help to keep their skin nice and warm and even some are waterproof like the beaver fur. It's gonna allow water to run right off of it. So mammals, do you think they're born live or hatched out of an egg? If you're a mammal, did your mom make a big nest in the living room and sit on an egg for nine months? I don't think she did. I bet you were born live. And when you were just a tiny baby, did you eat pizza? Hmm, or what did you drink as a baby? Milk. That's right. So mammal moms make milk to feed their babies. That's the most important thing to being a mammal. That's how we get that name, mammal. So I am going to show you a couple of mammals. Here are some really soft, cuddly mammals. These are baby rats and they're old enough now that they're no longer drinking milk from mom and they're eating seeds. But when they were real tiny, they didn't have all of their fur, their eyes weren't open, and the mammal mom made milk to feed her babies. These guys are sugar, spice, and licorice. Now, you can see that their fur is very, very soft, but not all mammals have to have this really soft fur. I'll show you one that's definitely not very soft at all. This is a hedgehog. Now this is uni, and uni is Japanese for urchin because I thought it looked like a little sea urchin. But you can see that they have kind of prickly fur. And what it is, it's a type of spine. Uh, quills are hollow and spines are not, and so a hedgehog has spines, but they use that to protect them. They do have softer fur on the belly, but when they feel threatened, they can sure poke you. Now, their quills, their spines, they cannot shoot them and neither can a porcupine because those quills are just modified hair. You can't shoot your hair out of your head 
and they can't shoot their hair out of their bodies either, but they can bump up against you and it can hurt. The next group that we're going to talk about is reptiles. This is one of my favorite groups and I know for a lot of people it is. And they like to think of these big reptiles. Can you think of a reptile that's really big and lives in Florida? Did you say alligator? Well, we're going to say what is it that makes that alligator a reptile? When we take a look at their body, what kind of skin do they have? Now this can be kind of tricky because what we're going to do is we're going to look at it when it has been out of the water for a little bit. So reptiles, what kind of skin do they have? They have dry, scaly skin. Now I have this is a shed from a snake that I have that you'll be able to see in just a few minutes here. But you'll be able to see that they have scales that are tiny and they have scales that are big. The ones on the bottom are called scoots and it helps them to scoot around on the ground, but it's spelled a little bit different. It's S-C-U-T-E. So they have dry scaly skin. Reptiles, do you think they're born live or are they hatched out of an egg? They are hatched out of eggs, but their eggs are kind of different. You know, we saw that chicken egg and how it kept its shape and it was hard, but reptile eggs are kind of soft and squishy, almost like one of those, like the toe of a leather shoe or something like that, how you can kind of squish it. And I have some snake eggs and they're dry now, but when the snake hatched out of it, it collapsed and it almost looks like a big snake raisin, doesn't it? <laughs> so that is the type of egg that a reptile has. Now, do the parents stay to help their babies? Well, that's kind of a tricky one. Most of them will lay their eggs and then the mom leaves and she never sees her baby. Think about a sea turtle. It goes onto the beach, it lays its eggs in the sand, it goes back into the ocean, and it never sees its babies. But you have other ones like alligators and crocodiles that may stay to protect its nest, and even after the babies hatch out of the eggs, will stay around and help the babies for just a little bit. Now I'm going to show you a couple of the reptiles that I have. This is a three-toed box turtle, and this one's name is Bento. I'm not sure how old she is, but I think she's over 30 years old. And you can see she's still kind of small, because not all turtles get to be really, really big. Some just stay small like this one. Now, this one is pretty cool. It gets its name box turtle because if you can see right here, there's a little line. It works like a hinge. So when I can push on this, and it's almost like a loose tooth, how it wiggles. But if this turtle was feeling threatened, they could put their head all the way in and their legs in and shut the door and shut the door back here too. And that's how they get the name box turtle. But not all turtles can do that. Most turtles are just able to tuck their head in and use their front legs there to protect their head. Now, a turtle can never, ever, ever climb out of its shell because the shell is a part of their backbone and their ribs all grown together. So you guys could not go to school and leave your backbone at home. And these guys could never leave their backbone either. It's a part of them. Some people want to know if they can feel through it. Well, the shell is made of keratin, which is the same thing that your hair and your fingernails are made out of. So you can cut your hair and your hair doesn't hurt because there aren't those nerve endings in your hair but you can feel when somebody touches your hair because it's attached to your head 
that does have the nerve endings in it. And the shell, the outside part right here, can't feel, but because it's attached to Bento, Bento can feel it when I scratch and touch the shell. Now here's an animal some of you might be familiar with because it's kind of a fairly common reptile pet. This is Peach, my bearded dragon. Now this is the shape that a lot of people refer to as a lizard. And you can take a look at the different types of scales that are on this body. Now they have some really cool scales that are called keeled because they have a little ridge that runs down the middle of each scale. But it has some interesting scales on the tummy. And you can see some of them right there. So with Peach being a reptile, was hatched out of an egg. This is a snake. This is my ball python named Lucille. Now, if you take a look at her, I don't know if you can see her eye right there, it looks cloudy. Now, that is because she is getting ready to shed, and we call that going blue. And she gets a little bit of a fluid built up between the old layer of skin that she's getting ready to shed and the new layer underneath of that, and that's gonna help her to be able to shed. Now, if you take a good look, you can see those smaller scales that are on the top, and on the bottom, you can see that the scales go across the whole bottom there. Lucille is about four feet in length, but the way she likes to curl up like this, it's hard to see how big she is. Okay, I'm trying to get now, use your skills that you've just learned. This is an animal that you've probably never seen before. This is called a blue tongue skink. And when he sticks his tongue out there, you can see how it gets its name. Now, if you look at its body, what is covering the body? Is it hair or fur, feathers, smooth and wet, scaly? That's right, it's dry, scaly skin. So what group would a blue tongue skink fit into? Bird, mammal, reptile, amphibian, or fish? If you said reptile, you are right. The next group of animals that we're gonna look at are amphibians. Amphibians can be kind of tricky when we look at them because some amphibians kind of look like reptiles because they have the same body shape as what we call lizards. But lizards are reptiles with dry, scaly skin. So here's one that when people look at it at first, they think reptile because it looks like a lizard, but if we look closely and we look at the skin, we'll see that it is smooth and wet. Now, amphibians will go through a big change in their life called metamorphosis. So when they are first in an egg, and that egg is kind of almost like jelly with a little bead in it, when they hatch out of those eggs, they don't look anything at all like what the grown-up looks like. Think about frogs. So frogs will hatch out of eggs, and those eggs are usually laid in water or someplace really wet. The parents usually don't stay to help the babies, and the babies are usually in the water when they first hatch out. Now, when they're that little, they will have gills. And gills, you've probably seen them on fish, you know, when they go out in like this, gills work to catch air bubbles that are in water. They don't breathe water, but water has hydrogen and oxygen in it, and they're pulling that oxygen out of the water to breathe, and that's the work of the gills. But as amphibians grow, their gills will slowly 
disappear and their lungs will take on most of the work of getting the oxygen in. And then with a little frog, they have a tail when they're a tadpole. Remember that word tadpole? And as they grow, that tail doesn't fall off, but they don't have it later on. And how that works is kind of like if you have one of those long skinny balloons and you blow really hard and all of a sudden you get that big bloop, that bubble part, and it still has the tail. As we keep blowing up that balloon, the body part grows and grows and grows until it gets to the end. And that's kind of how a tadpole grows. It's growing and it's finally gonna get all the way down to the end of that tail and it'll start getting legs and it'll go onto land. But a tadpole doesn't look anything at all like a frog when it's done, does it? And the same with some salamanders. Salamanders are an animal that people don't usually see because they like it when it's cool and damp. And they might find them sometimes even in wet basements or underneath of rocks outside. But I have a tiger salamander. This one's name is Tigger. And Tigger is gonna try to run around here. I'm gonna move Tigger like that. And you can see that Tigger has smooth, wet skin. And I even get my hands a little bit wet when I'm holding him, just so that I can make sure that Tigger is more comfortable. But this is a salamander. Now, I know we said that most amphibians will lay their eggs in the water. And you know what? Most of them, once the parents have laid the eggs, the parents go away and they never get to see their babies hatch out. But every now and then we have what's called an exception to the rule. And I have a frog that is the exception to the rule because this one lives in a place that's hot and dry for part of the year. And when there isn't any water, it will burrow deep down under the ground and do something that's kind of like hibernating, but we call it estivate because it's in a hot, dry time. And when there's been rain and it's been raining long enough and hard enough that the water has been able to trickle through the sand and reach to where it's estivating, it wakes it up and it climbs back up through the ground and lo and behold, there is a lake there. And at that point, they will start calling and find a mate, lay eggs. And now what happens is interesting with this one, the female will leave and the male will stay to help the babies. It will stay and protect the eggs. And then as they turn into tadpoles, the season goes on and the water starts to dry up, the dad will dig a little trench, a little canal that will connect the little pond that's shallow to the deeper pond and lead its babies in there. So it will take care of it. But the frog that does this is called an African giant bullfrog. This is my African giant bullfrog and his name is Tink. He's one year old. When I got him, he weighed seven grams, and just the other day, he weighed 700 grams. So he's grown quite a bit, but he still has a ways to go. He can get to be about three pounds when he's a full-grown adult. The females will weigh about a pound and a half. So it's about halfway grown. The last group that we're gonna talk about that have backbones are fish. In the family of fish, when we look at their body covering, we see that they have scales. Now, those scales are kind of like reptile ones, except there's a difference. They have a slime coat that covers them. So if you've ever been fishing and you've picked up a fish, you may have noticed that you had slime on your hands, and that's to help protect them. Now, fish will lay eggs. Most fish will lay eggs at the bottom of the river or the lake 
and then they leave and they never see their babies. There are a few exceptions to that though. Some of you may have had a pet discus and they may stay and help their babies. But another one, hmm, let's think. Can you think of a fish where the dad takes care of the babies? If you said seahorse, you are right. Once the eggs are laid and transferred to the dad, the dad is the one who will then take care of the babies. So I wanna thank you for joining me today and learning a little bit about animals and how we put them into animal families or groups like our birds, mammals, reptiles, amphibians, and fish.